Um, tell us a little bit about the emotional mask. Yeah. So emotional mask. So this is when we, you know, we, we show up and we, we, we put on a certain kind of emotion. Um, and so, um, it, it, there's a tricky thing here, Glenn, since I've even done this Ted talk on the one hand, we don't like an emotional mask because it can feel, it, it can feel inauthentic, right? We're not, we're right. not being real. We're, we're, we're kind of, you know, pretending to be a certain way. Right. Um, and, and we can kind of tell that on the other hand, what, if the pandemic has taught us anything, is that sometimes leaders have to show up in a way different than how they actually feel. Mm. So, you know, I had a client of mine a couple of years ago and um, it, he was really practicing vulnerability, but um, he had gotten double promoted. So he'd gotten promoted to be sitting in an interim senior HR role. And on the first meeting with his team, he announced that he'd gotten promoted and he immediately put his head in his hands and started crying. And he said, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> and the team said to me, they said, well, we appreciated his authenticity and vulnerability. That well, wasn't really what strength. we needed yeah. at the moment. We needed <laughs> yeah. a leader. We yeah, needed somebody exactly. who said, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. I, you know, we're going to be a good team. So, so sometimes we may be feeling that on the inside, but we've got to figure out a way to put on, uh, you know, a strong face because we need to be kind of the, the calm in the storm because we're going to set the tone. So emotional masks can, can kind of go either way. Uh, I think it's more about, uh, if anything, it's about self-awareness and intentionality. So, you know, the, the, the leaders that really helped their teams feel calm in the last year of uncertainty were the ones that, you know, said, okay, everybody, it's going to be okay. Uh, I might not have all the answers, but I know we can get through this together. Calm, intentionality, self-assessment, confidence. Yeah, confidence. Yeah. Okay. okay. You know, um, it struck me in, during your TED Talk, and I'd like to, I'm kind of getting off the subject just a little bit here and there, but I'd like to ask you about the personal story you shared Yeah, during that TED Talk. That had to be a very painful time in your life. Can you share a little bit about that and why you chose to share that and why that was such a powerful teaching moment in the TED Talk? Yeah, so... Um, so the story that I told was, you know, growing up, um, there was a lot of emotional contagion in my house. I had an older brother. Both my brothers were adopted. They, my parents were told they, they couldn't have kids. Uh, and then I, I, I came along, uh, along. Yeah. <laughs> surprise. Um, and my brothers were 12 and 11 years older than me. So I was, mm -hmm. I was much younger and my oldest brother, Chris, he was always, when he was home, there was a lot of yelling and screaming. And when he wasn't home, he was typically either in jail or a rehab center. So it, it created a lot of disruption in my house. Um, and it just, I can remember even being little, just always wanting to go play in my closet because it just felt like the safest place for, for me to be. And so when I was 10 years old, um, he had, he was staying at a rehab center in Florida and he, uh, didn't want to be there anymore. And he hitchhiked and he ended up coming uh, to our house and he was living with us for a little while. And he just decided life was, was way too hard. Um, and he took his own life. Uh, and that was a really traumatic experience for, for me and, and for my family. But it affected me sure. specifically in that I, I came down with a stutter. I, I couldn't I couldn't talk in public without stuttering. Um, and, and that was going into middle school, which I, in retrospect, I, I don't recommend for anyone. Yeah, really. So, Especially middle school, yeah. yeah. So every day before middle school, and I was just a little skinny kid, and I've got this stutter. And every day before um, middle school, I'd have to go see my speech therapist, and I'd work on my Bs and my Ps and my Ts. Um, and so for, for me not only how kids are treated with stutters, but how my life was at home with my brother, I just decided people were way too messy and I just wanted to distance myself from people. So I became kind of a world-class wallflower. I just distanced mm -hmm. myself. And that was all the way through high school and then went on, I kind of carried through college um, and I ended up majoring in communications. I'm not quite sure exactly yeah, yeah. how that happened. And like most good communication majors, I was um, unemployed at graduation. Um, trying to find a job. And I ended up getting this job with my, with um, a retail store. And I was a, sm it was a small privately held retail store. My boss was the son-in-law of the business. And um, I was going to be the assistant manager at one of these stores. And um, on my first day of work, I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, he greeted me at the door and he said, before you get started, I have a task for you. Waiting for you in the, in the back room is the current assistant manager of the store, but he doesn't know you're coming. So your job is to go back there, you fire him and you get his job. Uh, mm. And that was, that was my first task, my first real full-time job. I'd worked lots of other jobs, but that was my first real full-time job. And that was how my boss rolled. He'd come in, he'd say, he loves surprise visits, love trying to catch people doing something wrong. He'd say, I don't like what Sharon's wearing, go fire her. 
then I had to do more layoffs in the first six months of that job than any other time in, in, in my life. Right. Um, and, and that particular experience coupled with my time with my brother, it, it all kind of came together in this one singular moment where I had this kind of aha moment about my life and where I wanted to go. Um, first I realized, you know, work shouldn't have to suck. It should be a source of fulfillment, and meaning and purpose for us, not a source of stress and anxiety and depression. I mean, we have those elements. It is work. Um, but I want to change that. Second, if my boss was any indication of, of the kind of leaders in the world, I, I want to fix that. Um, third, um, you know, we, we can't choose the families that we're given. We're, we're, you, you kind of get what you get, um, but you can choose your workplaces. You have a lot more control over that. And we spend so much of our time at work. Um, and so that was really where my path was set. And I, and I, and I, and it was in that moment, I decided I wanted to eliminate all workplace dysfunction everywhere forever. Uh, uh, <laughs> of course, having no idea what I signed up for, Glenn. <laughs> you will be working forever. <laughs> I will be. I will be. It's a, I always tell people like I'm, I'm, I've got plenty of job security. Um, so, uh, that's really how it kind of set out. So, uh, you know, I wanted to share that story at the end because I want people to understand why I'm so passionate about what I'm doing, but also to see that connection because, you know, emotional contagion happens at home too. Um, and if we can, if we get a better understanding of that, you know, we can create healthier spaces for us, whether it's at work mm -hmm. or, or even at home in our families. You know, it's the passion that you, that you carry for this. I mean, we're teasing and laughing a little bit when you say you want to get rid of all dysfunction, which means that you're working forever. 